A very good morning to all of you. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong. It's uh, moving into 10 a.m. over there in Tokyo, where it's all about the BOJ today, the land of rising sun, the land, land of perhaps rising inflation, <laughs> and at some point, perhaps the land of rising interest rates. Welcome to the program. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong, in Beijing, and in Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, China Open. I'm, I'm David Ingdes with Annabelle Drewlers. Yeah, Dave, and the BOJ, of course, it is our top story of the hour of markets across the course of this morning. We're seeing traders hedging the yen, uh, seeing a high risk of a policy surprise when the Bank of Japan does wrap up its final meeting of the year, that one ahead in the coming hours. Oil near a two-week high as more shippers shun the Red Sea, blaming a rise in attacks on vessels along the key waterway. Plus, Apple plotting a rescue mission for its $17 billion smartwatch business, with the latest model set to be pulled from US. US stores over a patent battle. So key one to watch, of course, David, yep. in the session today, those Apple supplies. Uh, yes, we understand plotting some sort of uh, pushback on that patent battle. But the focus really coming down to, to the Bank of Japan today in the session, what we can expect, any sort of policy surprise, even though at the same time you kind of think maybe we need to wait just a little bit longer. Well, the consensus seems to be that they won't do anything this time around. And it almost brings to mind what they did last year was a big surprise. Now, certainly, you know, with the passage of time, you know, we are looking at them of moving the needle a little bit further. That said, to your point, they might do something today or they might give us an indication of what they might do, of course, in the yeah. following meetings. Certainly a lot of the people that we talked and have a look at markets while you discuss this is every meeting from now maybe up until april is live as far as the boj is concerned there we go uh, approaching the chinese open about what 28 minutes away uh we're down about a quarter one percent on a50 futures trading over uh in singapore a couple of markets coming online flat low volumes it's a time of the year where uh, just about every one you know their dentist and their puppy uh, are probably on their holiday if not already uh nikkei 225 unchanged we're looking at the banks they're also unchanged so trading sideways uh perhaps more a <clears throat> uh, index construction function here. Wiper well, has a top edge is lower, three tenths of one percent. Within that, there's a Nippon Steel story, which we will unpack for you, you guys, in just a moment there. Uh, as far as the yen is concerned, so we're trading at the higher end of the three month, three, not three months, sorry, three day range uh, on many of these pairs. Dollar yen, um, as you can see here, 143, 142 and change right now. Overnight vol though, so low expectations. Uh, overnight vol bottom of your screens at 35. It's the most expensive hedging cost going back to the last week, which is back in July. So there is some hedging going on ahead of what <clears throat> perhaps might be in store as far as the BOJ is concerned. Bond markets, uh, your tens. Uh, CGB yields at three month lows. Uh, they're about to at 263. Uh, we're picking up a little bit on the twos and the tens in, in the U.S. here. Aussie up a little bit right now, six basis points, and a focus on commodity markets in particular because of what's been going on and certainly the momentum has picked up in terms of just uh, disruptions to trade and sort of seaborne traffic in the Red Sea because of what's taking place there. Oil is bit up further after about a 2% pop overnight, uh, 3 tenths of 1%. Shanghai is coming online, reflecting the big move overnight, 2.6% to the upside. More on this a bit later on. But of course, back to the BOJ here, Bill. Yeah, it's really the big focus of this mm. morning. And, and when exactly we're going to start to see any sort of shift away from exit, exit, ne exiting negative interest rates, scrapping yield curve control as well. But let's uh, bring in Bloomberg Economics. They're a little bit out of concern. Census, it does mm. seem, uh, given that their expectations for a shift is in the second half of the year. Uh, senior Japan economist Taro Kimura joining us now from, from Tokyo. Mm. So Taro, uh, let's just start with your outlook for the Bank of Japan and also Japan's economy in, in general here. Right. I, I think it's a very difficult timing for me to speak about um, BOJ's outlook. My base case is um, the BOJ will end uh, YCC and negative rates in July. And I'm ha having a kind of la later positioning than the consensus. Um, however, um, and, and today, I don't think the BOJ will move 
uh, today. However, um, there's a breaking news from the uh, that the, the eco minister is attending the BOJ's meeting today, and it's not unprecedented, but it means something. So probably um, they will step up some communication for uh, exiting from negative mm -hmm. interest rate. Probably they will include something in the statement or the way that will say something uh, specific on the exit in the press conference. Um, but um, I still kind of um, hold uh, my vision that the BOJ needs need some time until July to exit because uh, based on their communication, um, they want to communicate well beforehand. And looking back at the BOJ's exit, from its first quantitative easing, which started back in 2001, and when they exited uh, in 2006, um, they included some statement uh, on the potential policy shift in its official outlook report um, six months before the actual exit. So um, still, like you know, I, I know the things are, the calls are getting earlier, but at the, at the same time, um, we have to be all ears to um, BOJ's communication. Probably they will. Uh, include some statement or a change mess, uh, accelerate the exit uh, messages further today, but uh, we have to be careful on judging when they actually exit. Yeah, taro you know, I, what I was going to get to that, you know, they, they, they slowly, to your point, want to massage uh, you know, any forthcoming change into the minds of the markets very slowly. So in terms of any potential, to your point, changes in statement, uh, you know, some of the terms that they use, is there anything specific that you think we should be paying attention to? Right. Um, I don't have a specific idea because um, Exit Talks is kind of for the first time in, um, what was that, um, more than 15 years for the Bank of Japan. So I, I don't know what they right. want to do. I, I, I Honestly, I don't have any specific guess. However, um, I think um, so far the BOJ's communication was about what if scenarios, thought experiments about what if the BOJ exit from negative rates and what if yields, are, yields rose from negative. Uh, uh, however, they, they, the naturally thinking the next step for them is actually mentioning, yes, we are at the stage of considering the exit from negative rates or YCC, and probably they will include that in the statement as they did in the uh, in the outlook report back in 2005, or uh, Weda will mention something, uh, step up his remarks on the exit in the press conference. Yeah, well, the, the, the remarks that we've heard from Ueda so far, to, to David's point, have, have had really big uh, impact in the market. So what sort of moves are you expecting today in, in the Japanese yen and yields as a result of the meeting? Right. Um, if Ueda uh, steer clear about um, um, the exit timing in the press conference today, um, that will prob I think that's still a chance today. Um, that will probably uh, meaning um, uh, weaker yen and um, um, lower uh, lower yields because some market uh, a lot of markets expects the exit in uh, January the next meeting. However, um, if Ueda mentions uh, as I said s something specific about the exit that that will uh, bring a opposite power to the yen and yields. All right, Taro Kimura, thanks mm. very much for your time this morning. That was Bloomberg's senior Japan economist. Let's discuss the Bank of Japan further, what we're expecting out of this decision, and bring in our first guest of this morning. That's Anitza Nip, head of fixed income research Asia at UBP. Uh, Anitza, thanks very much for joining us this morning in studio. You're really looking at two conditions here that need to be satisfied in order to see any sort of change away from the current policies, right? Exactly. Um, basically, you know, it, it's we expect BOJ is not going to make any changes on the decision today. Um, but there's two conditions. One would be sort of, you know, they will look at the yield curve control with the 10 years JGB. At the moment, it's below 1%. Last time, they sort of, you know, changed it to the cap of like 1%. Um, at the moment, we don't see that, you know, it's over 1%. So we just don't think that, you know, they will move 
Um, so, you know, they will look first of all at the YCC. The other would be the inflation forecast, because at the moment, what they are trying to look at would be if the inflation is over 2 percent sustainably, that is the core core um, CPI number, mm. um, especially, you know, next year in the first quarter, they are talking about like those um, wage negotiation. If they could see that the inflation target is well over 2 percent in a sustainable manner, then in a way, then they may consider some sort of change. Otherwise, we just think that it would be gradually. Um, and and I think definitely, as you know, um, other people mentioned that um, inflation forecasts, their comments about YCC will be important going forward. I think market at the moment is like, you know, pricing in a bit about like April that, mm. you know, they're going to move. But for us, we think that, you know, they just gradually definitely today will be important in terms of their comments. Right. Uh, and, you know, we can we can debate the timing of when the BOJ does it. But, but do you think we are eventually headed for a positive interest rate in Japan, number one, and number two, connected to that, how high do you think 10-year JGB yields get next year? Well, at the moment, I would say um, eventually it's, you know, going to that direction because yeah. the inflation seems to be sort of, you know, stay around below 2%. They got inflation, hmm. but therefore, you know, um, in the future, um, there's possibility they would change it. Um, in terms of JGB, I think, you know, if the inflation doesn't really pick up, I think, you know, it would stay around, you know, like 1% level hmm. around there. Um, so that's why, you know, BOJ would need time really to monitor the situation before they would make any substantial change or surprise the market. <laughs> How does that sort of play into your credit strategy then, your, your way yeah. of thinking of where the Bank of Japan goes because you, you still are favoring Japanese banks? Yes, correct. Okay, um, I think, you know, for Japanese banks, the main reason that we like it is because of the pickup that they have over the U.S. Um, banks as well. And also we've been seeing supply from the Japanese banks, so that's why in 2024 what we prefer would be um, definitely some of the IG credits and Japanese banks are, you know, very, very quality IG credit with strong fundamental and they also got government support. So Japanese bank would be one of the things that we like. Um, you know, of course, you know, BOJ policy would also be something to play into it, but more because of the pickup over the U.S. banks. The other we like would be the Japanese insurance company because they are the one that would really stable credit. I mean, I think, you know, for, for us looking at the Asia credit, what we look at would be, you know, how the Fed is going, you know, to go going forward. Um, for 2024, we expect the Fed would start the rate cut um, after the second quarter as second half okay so um, in a way that means you know we're still looking for something on the short end IG name qualities the main reason is like recently when you look at the movement on the 10-year US Treasury which is below 4% which we mm. think is not sustainable because at the moment since people are pricing in the recession mm. but which is not the case for us we think it's you know more on the soft landing yes growth could be slowed down but the figure still sort of makes the labor market you know non farm payroll numbers still pretty good so that's why we think at the moment the best price for 2024 would be the short end quality IG credits. Right. Well, okay, let's say let's say four percent right now on, on the ten year. This time next year, do you think we're higher or lower? Uh, we, it will go higher. Um because we'll be higher in the ten year yield. Yes. This time next year. Uh, this time next year, yes. The main reason is because also the curve is going to normalize. Mm. Um, as we said, at the moment, it's 3.92%. It's definitely, you know, much lower than, um, you know, what we expect. And I think it's also because of the liquidity in the market. I think, you know, time next year, even though we are talking about, you know, rate cut, but I think because there's still supply in terms of U.S. Treasury and also the budget deficit, election, a lot of, you know, uncertainty, um, you know, in 2024. To be honest, it's hard to predict, you know, by year-end of, you know, 2024, mm. but we expect, you know, it, it shouldn't be, you know, below 4%. Okay. That's a little bit out of consensus because a lot of really people is. actually yeah. see, it, see it going lower. So uh, you said about Treasury supply, but what else is sort of informing that, that perspective? Well, mainly it's because, you know, um, the curve lead to the normalized, right? Um, either it's now it's like inverted. Yep. So, um, you know, we reckon that it either would be flat or, you know, back to sort of, you know, upward sloping. Hmm. At the moment, when you look at like the two years U.S. Treasury, it's down from 5% to 4.6%. Okay, so. So if even market consensus is talking about 75 basis point cut from the top of the two years, which is around like what, five, over 5%, 5.2, you know, if you're talking about 75, you are talking about like, you know, two years around like 4.5. And at the moment, if you are talking about normalizing a curve, there's no way that the 10 year should be, you know, below 4%. Okay, interesting. We'll use that as the jump of point to talk about other things, of course, that your call is there. Anitta Nip stays with us uh, for a couple of minutes. Any questions to her, of course, for our clients, you know where to reach 
delicious on your Bloomberg terminals. Uh, right, now just ahead here, uh, we're also talking to JP Morgan. So Lillian Lung runs their income fund, and we'll ask her, of course, what the greatest strategies are, of course, going into uh, next year, counting down to the open of trade in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, and here in Hong Kong, 15 minutes away. This is Bloomberg Markets China Open. Good morning. All right, uh, your midpoint of the day out of the PBOC as a 709 handle, just below 70, well, 710, 709.82 to spread to the estimates is, that's what, 400, give or take, pips. Uh, we are stronger, lightly, slightly on the Chinese currency right now. Yeah, let's get back to, to what we're seeing in Asian credit, the yeah. outlook for 2024, because our guest, Anit Zanip, head of fixed income research, Asia at UBP is still with us. When you're talking with different investors, different clients in the market, what is your top uh, investment pick for next year? Well, first of all, um, you know, I am recommending clients to go for short end, as mentioned, two mm -hmm. to four year, two to five years, you know, quality IG credit. The main reason is because the credit spread sort of range bound this year. OK, U.S. Treasury are the one that giving return for the investor. Yeah. So we reckon that, you know, next year there would be volatility. So if you go for high yields, it could, you know, widen out, be more vulnerable. So we go for IG. So talking about like topics, as you know, mentioned earlier, um, we like Japanese bank, insurance company. For clients who more have a defensive appetite, we'll ask them to go for the Korean banks as well as the corporates because they are the ones that would supply. I think the market for Asia credit at the moment, the issue would be supply because it's very difficult sometimes really to get enough bond in the market. So they need to where, you know, the supply come from. Um, Japanese banks, insurance, Korean names. The other one that we like actually is Hong Kong corporates. I understand some investors or some, you know, other speakers, you know, in Bloomberg are saying that, oh, they worry about the Hong Kong corporates. But in fact, if you talk about like Fed is going to cut next year, the interbank sort of like Hong Kong dollar funding market would also having released a bit of the pressure mm. because we are packed, right? So um, the Hong Kong corporate that people worry about would be the headline risk from China. At the same time, it's worried about like their funding costs, their borrowing costs. If these two can be eased, then that means, you know, they would be stable. But we reckon that, you know, Hong Kong corporate would like only the investment grade bonds, quality one, you know, cash rich, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in a way, that would the other one that, you know, we like. But investors have to be really careful because it could be volatile as well going forward. But if you stay on the like five year senior paper, not the perpetual bond, you know, it should be good for carry as well. The last one that we like would be China tech names, mm. um, the bigger one, because we see the regulatory risks from um, Chinese government are less. And at the same time, they are also in, you know, good IG rating. Recently, Moody sort of revised the outlook of China and Hong Kong, you know, to negative. Yeah. Some of the tech names also been, you know, revised on the, the you outlook. Know, rating outlook. But then we don't think that they are going to trigger move because, you know, revising negative outlook do have time really, you know, for the credit to improve. So that's why China tech names, we don't worry about it. We think it's, you know, good to lock in deal at this point. And they also offer a good pickup of around like 60 basis points to the U.S. peer, you know, names like that. Yeah. What if we do get, and, you know, who knows if Moody's does move on the ratings? Does it matter? Um, of course, you know, if it downgraded, it, it matters, right? Because I think at the moment it's not sort of um, factor into the spread at the moment. Mm. People only factor in sort of negative outlook. But then again, um, they got, you know, quite some time for the rating agency sort of, um, you know, to look at the corporates and also to um, look at the negative outlook again before they would trigger the downgrade. So at this point, we just don't, you know, worry too much about it as long as you stay with sort of below five years. Yeah. Okay. So shorter in duration, better Correct. quality still in tech. Um, our analysts at Bloomberg Intelligence have put this headline out. Interesting. I want to get your thoughts on this. So you mentioned Chinese tech. Yeah. I'm guessing Tencent is one of them. Uh, more than 150 Chinese property bonds, this makes sense in a while, um, are trading at less than 10 cents mm. on the dollar. 150 yeah. securities. Yeah. Would you go anywhere near? 
Yes, well, please. we're still very cautious about the sector. The main reason will be, okay, yes, there's you know a lot of recent policies from the government talking about you know reducing down payment, you know trying to support the sector. They've been talking a lot about it. Um, at the same time, we know you know one of those policies that been filled out will be the bank support. Mm. That is, you know, they put up sort of three minimum, you know, for the banks really to lend to the sector. Um, Bloomberg also mentioned about the whitelist, right? But yeah. you know, it haven't sort of you know come out in the market. So we reckon that. Um, um, liquidity is still tight. Most importantly, would be confidence of buyer in the property market. Okay, if we don't see confidence in buying property, contractor sales would you know would not go up. No improvement on cash flow. It's very difficult, I would say. So that's why now we're cautious. We think that. No, not really that you know, we will look into at this stage unless we see more and more policy and contractor sales come up. Happy New Year to you if we don't see Same you again. You. There we go. We'll speak in 2024. Anit Sanip, their head of fixed income research at, for Asia at UBP. Okay, the other big story we're tracking here, of course, is what's been taking place yep. in the commodities markets. And we're looking at, well, the Shanghai contract on oil is up 2.5% following the big move overnight. And we're looking at gas futures 7%. Oh, we don't have it there. Why not? Anyway, we'll talk more about that. But certainly... It's really about what's taking place in the Red Sea and some of the disruptions we're seeing there so far. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just to put it in context here, the, the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, it is a major route for global LNG trade. And that's what's really emerged over the last couple of years. So you take a look, really the big spike there is in European gas futures. And you can understand that given it is that key uh, way that, that gas is going into the European region. But what we're hearing or what we understand is that uh, BP and others are, are pausing a lot of shipments through the Red Sea because a lot of attacks on merchant vessels has escalated as well. Yeah, and you know, we're looking at some of them, to your point, Bill, getting diverted. They're taking the longer route around the Horn of Africa mm. uh, at this point in time. So yeah, we're keeping an eye on this. And of course, if you want to have more details on this and certainly the choke point you see on your screens, a ton of vessels, of course, are still passing through, of course, the Suez and into that part of the world. Uh, just, of course, keep an eye on this. That's MAPCO on your yeah, return. I think you also just want to understand as well, in case we didn't give that context properly, but it's Iran-backed Houthis who say that yes. they're targeting vessels with any sort of connection, connection. to Israel. And that's a response to, to the war with Hamas. So it's really the most tangible sign of disruption that we've seen so far to energy flows uh, since the war started. And of course, we're going into the third month of yeah. this conflict now. But another tr story that we're tracking here this morning mm -hmm. as well is uh, Chinese state media saying that more than 110 people have been killed after a 6.2 magnitude earthquake struck the country's northwest late on Monday. Uh, most victims were in the Gangsu province. That's one of the poorest regions in mainland China. And hundreds more people as well were injured. Uh, President Xi Jinping has urged officials to go all out with search and rescue operations. So just some of the, the, the footage that we have from that uh, earthquake zone uh, that you're seeing right now. Uh, we'll have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. We're just a couple of minutes out from the open now of mainland stocks, Hong Kong trading as well. Two big movers we've got to know this morning. So far, there's NEO. It's a spike in there. You can see it's got a big cash injection coming through from Abu Dhabi. And then Country Garden as well, that slump there because it's warning of uh, impairment charges. Yeah, uh, giving a sort of a, a bleaker range here as far as the, the drop in income this year is concerned. There we go, bottom of your screen. So it takes us into really what futures are pointing to. Futures are pointing to a lower open Hang Seng, four tenths of one percent. Uh, we're looking at oil prices in Shanghai uh, catching up to the move in Brent overnight. Dollar China, 7.14.27 uh, right now. We're slightly weaker there in the Chinese currency. One level to watch on the Shanghai Composite. We're within one and a half percent of a fresh three-year low. The open is next. This is Bloomberg. Right. Welcome back to shows. It's a bit quiet out there. Now, that being said, it's also a bit cold out there, too. So with the amount of boots in the ground, you think there was a war going on here in the region there. <laughs> it's boot season. That's what I'm mentioning. Oh, okay. Gosh. <laughs> Oil prices in Shanghai and focus 2886 is a level we're tracking. We're within one and a half percent of that. That's the low we hit back in 2022. Below that, we're back to levels of 2020, I believe. And of course, an update on what took place overnight, this earthquake in Qinghai, in the Gansu province and any 
updates, of course, coming out of state media. Welcome back to the show. So hope you're all well. Uh, just going into the open here, Bill. Yeah, that's right. A couple of seconds away. But as you said, the, the key level we're watching today for the Shanghai Composite, are we going to be hitting a fresh three-year low as well for that benchmark here? But the open's upon us. And so far across the screen today, uh, we're going to be seeing quite a bit of weakness. At least that's if uh, futures there were a bit of a guide for the session so far. But uh, really, we're, we're keeping across a lot of different sectors this morning. Pretty mixed as we come online. Energy, of course, one to watch because you do have those disruptions coming yeah. through in the Red Sea. Uh, we're also just keeping an outlook eye on the outlook for tech stocks as well. They've really just been bearing the brunt of the, the, the losses over the past few days. And you can see that Hang Seng Tech Index down around 7 tenths of percent. But broadly, it's a lot of weakness here coming across the screen. When you take a look at those benchmarks there at the top, uh, let's change on uh, the other sector or regions or benchmarks that we're just tracking here today. Again, it is really more red here across the screen. So this one really just diving into those sector focuses in China. You can see all of these pretty much are in the red, except we are seeing Macau gaming stock there fairly flat but we are getting a little bit more optimism coming through for the gaming space in turn uh, let's change on take a look at some of the movers that could be playing into this dynamic today so apple of course really one to watch and you can see those two big supplies there luck share one of the big ones that's listed in mainland china but a big supply into apple and of course the big story today is that uh, apple seems to have lost a patent uh, lawsuit and so it's being forced to pull u.s sales of its watch which is their very key season. Of course, it's exactly when you don't want to be forced to take Apple Watches off the shelves. Uh, Apple's saying it's going to be pushed back on that with a bit of a different strategy. But let's uh, change on because more movers in focus this morning. Uh, one of those, of course, is what we're seeing with NEO so far. Uh, EV maker, of course, in China, a very big one, and it's just got a big cash injection as well from Abu Dhabi, so a key investor there. And you can see that stock really just follows what we had on the Wall Street session for that name. And Country Garden as well, and we can get more on this in just a few minutes from now. But uh, warning of impairment charges uh, setting aside billions of yuan, it seems, really, to try and cover those. So uh, certainly another signal that uh, there's still a lot of weakness in the Chinese property sector and the efforts that we've seen so far from policymakers do not appear to be working just yet. Yeah, and they're probably not going to show up in the full year earnings, really. So that's probably going to be a 2024 story. For more, really, on what the market looks like and what, I guess, uh, to some extent, because markets haven't done very well, is it a year for income? Joining us here on set is Lillian Lung, PM uh, at the China Income Fund at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Good morning. Good morning. How's the fund done this year? Well, I think versus some of the other kind of growthy related fund, the fund is actually performing uh, relatively better because okay. like the markets tend to try to look for safe havens and mm. China income kind of exposure is more towards that side. Mm. So basically, um, you know, positive on in terms of that kind of style favor. Mm. That's interesting, though, because I think when you take a look at the top holdings at Tencent, China Construction Bank, Ping An Insurance Group, NetEase, these are all sectors that have seen a lot of weakness over the course of this year. Um, yes, but if you look at our over equities kind of fund exposure, we do have a higher um, exposure towards the high dividend income, uh, dividend kind of view. So our fund kind of expected yield is about, roughly about four to five, uh, close to five percent, which is basically much higher than the market. And supposedly the, our overall kind of beta of the fund is also lower than the market as well. So although the top holding is like still towards the big cat names, but we do have a long tail of the uh, relatively stable and steady kind of earnings um, kind of uh, yield kind of plays. And also we do have some uh, interesting exposure through the industrial name as well. So that's, I think, some of the opportunities uh, from the China market is not only from like the, uh, the super high dividend yield stocks, but also coming from some names with potential recovery in earnings and also a dividend growth. So that's what we have been focusing on. And, you know, interesting because, you know, amidst the economic softness mm. and weakness, yes. you know, what's interesting is, I, I don't know, give me the trends you're seeing as far as dividend mm. growth mm. and also buybacks. You know, yeah. how, how do you see that? going into next year because revenues haven't actually been yeah. blasting through the ceiling. Yes, exactly. I think that's actually the key points about um, income investing because as, as we are heading into a decelerating growth, um, income or earnings growth, try, most of the income, uh, earnings growth will probably coming from like cost efficiency improvement and also dividend growth will also be very much rely on the improvement in capital or shoulders kind of return as well. Right. And as we have been seeing in the last few years, we know there's a substantial increase in corporates there putting more focus on that. So like for example, Tencent, we cannot really own in the past, mm. but as you can see, we are basically beefing up the kind of dividend payout and also buyback. It's not only Tencent, but it's basically we are seeing more of these kind of internet giants that with 
huge cash reserve and they're willing to pay back to shareholders. I think there's a trend and they offer more opportunities for us to pick the stock. And of course, market is weak, mm. but as we are seeing better corporate governance uh, coming from a broader base of, uh, of companies, we should be able to see this kind of turnaround in terms of valuation rating uh, in the medium term. That's actually our uh, increasingly our focus as well, trying to look for some kind of undervalued kind of play mm. on that. Yeah, so what's, the, what's sort of the, the, the impetus for companies to, to, to increase their shareholder returns and to, to generate better corporate governance? Who's really driving that? Is it the companies themselves or uh, are you hearing it's coming from, from top down? Well, I think both. Uh, say for example, some of the SOE, they definitely got some kind of encouragement from the government trying to improve the ROE over long term. I think that's some of the proposition earlier this year mm. that basically drive a bit of the rating of SOE. But at the same time, the private enterprises like internet names, um, they have they are actually still very healthy in terms of free cash flow generation. And at the same time, as the economy is going to slow down or some kind of disinflationary pressure is come on, um, they might be able to, they, they might actually find it more difficult to find kind of um, new investment kind of vehicles. So therefore, the focus will then shift back to like, okay, we have huge cash reserve, respond to uh, investor, kind of, investor kind of request, and they're basically improving the um, you know, capital return kind of policy. And I think that's basically we have been seeing both from SOD and also private enterprise to basically improve that. And um, increasingly, uh, that's, I think so far year to day, uh, Hong Kong Exchange, in the overall buyback in Hong Kong Exchange, kind of, as the company is already you know, surpassing 2022 kind of level. So I think there's kind of the trend that we, we expect to see more and more kind uh, come on in going forward. So you, you, you mentioned SOE. It's interesting, you know, the, the conversation around exposure mm. to Chinese banks. You know, those are dividend plays. Those are income mm. plays, and also utilities. Mm. How have you managed your banking exposure? Your exposure to Chinese banks. Well, we are kind of like neutralish because as market come off, we are seeing more high yield opportunities in more the set of sectors. So we used to, yeah, because we used to, you know, have kind of overweight in banks. Like it just only used ago. to be banks. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And now we are seeing more opportunities from utilities, from industrial and some of the other sectors as well. And actually for income strategy, we are not only focusing just on high, super high dividend you know, yield play because they probably will have very limited earnings growth. But we are also looking for opportunities from some of the cyclical names that basically hit the bottom, but the potential recovery in earnings. Mm. So like, for example, what we are finding interesting right now is about the consumer electronics kind of segments where the, they are actually a single bottom. Valuation of most of this kind of supply chain is also at a very attractive level. But if we're seeing some potential recovery in demand next year, uh, either driven by restocking or driven by some kind of new technology bringing into the consumer electronics, um, that kind of recovery would be also interesting uh, mm -hmm. for our strategy as well. What's your outlook, though, for the Chinese economy going into next year? Are you sort of expecting any sort of pickup to come through, or how concerned are you as well by the sort of external factors, yeah, like I, a broader mm. global slowdown? Well, I guess for China economic growth, we probably will see some kind of decelerating trend to continue, and in particular, the disinflationary environment is probably likely to to linger around at least in first half this next year. So I think that will be the key kind of source of pressure. So therefore, we are expecting um, stop picking bottom up approach will still be very important in you know in driving this strategy. And uh, as I just mentioned, because we are seeing this kind of top line pressure, um, earnings growth will need to be driven more by from the cost side. So one part right. of our strategy is probably looking for some names that like utility with steady top line, but they may benefit from from lower for longer interest rate environment in China uh, that may translate into better earnings and they have a very decent kind of cap uh, you know, definite payout ratio. Um, so that would be some of the sectors that we think would be interesting. I guess for. as a follow-up to Bell's question on, you know, the macro environment has given us a very low inflation yeah. environment in yeah. China, if not yeah. deflation in some cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How has that shown up? Uh, yeah. and the companies in your portfolio? Well, I guess the most um, apparent thing is like when we talk about like consumer stables in last mm. year, earlier this year, there are lots of talks about like raising prices right. uh, for like stable you know, milk, and beer and, and things like that. But getting into that, getting into this kind of disinflationary environment, uh, it might be more difficult for them to, to raise prices. It will be more challenging for them to raise prices. So I think that's the one of the... But are cost problems. pressures down? Yes, yes, exactly. So okay. therefore we need to look for the names that we are seeing that potentially we're seeing uh, a lot more relief on the cost side and uh, 
and uh, the guy highly geared names could be interesting as long as they're able to maintain a steady top line, just like utilities I just mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what, what are you seeing as far as going into next year? I mean, we're mm. three years of losses on overall in the benchmark mm, itself. Mm, mm. What are you seeing as far as fund redemptions or fund inflows? Um, Recently, yeah. And do you have a projection? Right. Like, what's your gut feel? Oh, yeah. that's definitely like uh, funds kind of alpha. Um, it's not only like the mutual fund, but we have been seeing like foreign investor like yeah. cutting the exposure to China. I think expectation right now is already very, very low. So evaluation already resets to a very kind of um, low level as well. So on that front, probably incrementally the risk will be lower in the ending to next year. Right. But then the key risk is whether or uh, when we're going to see a reversion of earnings estimate. Um, that might probably take some time because uh, we still see some kind of data rate in terms of earning estimate. Um, but as all this kind of policy is going to to become effective, although take a bit longer than expected, mm-hmm. kind of period to realize the impact, mm-hmm. but then it will ultimately be translating into some stabilization in consumer confidence and corporate confidence. And, and by then, there will be a kind of good setup for the kind of recovery. All right, stabilization seems yeah. to be. Patience. <laughs> stabilization first. Yeah. We're all patient anyway, right? Yeah. Okay. I think we, anyone who's a China investor has been pretty patient over the last well, few years. Well, you, you, you've learned the virtue. <laughs> That's right. right. Oh, Lillian Lung, thanks very much for your time this morning. That was a Portfolio Manager of China Income Fund at JB Morgan Asset Management. But uh, actually, we've got maybe a, On this topic. a glimmer of hope that's yeah. coming through because China's $680 billion offshore credit market has entered its least troubled period since the property crisis spread two years ago. Let's get more on that now with uh, our reporter joining us this morning. That's uh, China credit reporter Pearl, Pearl Liu. So this China credit tracker has just come out at the top of the hour. And yeah, I mean, are we seeing maybe a, a, some green shoots appearing here? Hi. Um, yeah, actually, I think um, there are like two um, two stories here. Like, so we um, the in the the, the stress level is actually testing the non-defaulted ones. So for them, we are seeing a little bit release because we are seeing like the China, um, the Chinese authorities are signaling some of the releasing measures, saving measures. Well, um, for um, the already defaulted ones, we still see like much stress on them. Well, what's helping the market? Why are uh, things slightly better? Yeah, like um, like I said, like um, the founding measures, um, we were seeing like some potential um, policies under discussion announced, like um, basically discussed the last month, including the white list and okay. including the unsecured uh, short-term loan. But all those are under discussion, so we're still like seeing when will those will be officially announced and launched. For the names that have already defaulted, though, I mean, what's going to happen to them? Um, for them, like um, they're still um, looking for like those uh, this restructuring process. Um, they're still waiting for a sales recovery to help with the recovery value, and we will see more um, wind up court hearings for Evergrande and for Logan like in the new year. Okay, which means your team's going to be busy still next year. <laughs> you probably need another headcount, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, if our bosses are listening, yeah, heed that advice. Prilio, fantastic team there, of course, our credit team. Uh, our China credit team, Prilio, of course, one of them here. All right. Um, well, there's, uh, suffice to say, plenty more ahead. We're about 13 minutes into the session, and we're looking at some modest downside across equity markets as we speak. A full roundup of the market action just ahead. This is Bloomberg. Okay, um, yeah, we'll take you straight back really to this volcanic eruption taking place. Um, it actually begun a few hours back in, in ice. Now we're continuing to track that. And uh, No, I'm not going to try and pronounce where that's taking place. Uh, but yeah, there we Grindavik. go. How do you say it? Grindavik. Grindavik. We can go with that. But I think you want to give the context as well because yes. uh, the town, it, it's, it's just near the capital, hmm. Reykjavik, uh, about 40 kilometers away, or that's 25 miles if you're in that sort of uh, miles terminology. But uh, as you said, it was evacuated in early November. So, yeah. And we all know, of course, one. what happened a few years back when the last big 
volcanic eruption took place in in Iceland, of course, and all the travel disruptions, huge and disruptions travel and logistics disruptions. And everything. Yeah, but so far not seeing anything for the main airport, and I think part of that reason is I think it's a little bit more concentrated in la inland the, mm. the 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 lava that's coming out of the ground, and so I think it's when it really gets into the sea that's when you can get that big volcanic ash that rises. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what other stuff do you know, Bill? <laughs> All right. Research. Okay, let's have a look at markets right now from this. Uh, global macro movers for you. Stocks on the way. Well, okay, let's call it sideways on the benchmark. We're, uh, upper, we're up in, in some markets. Uh, when mm -hmm. Chinese markets opened up, so you had the greater pull from the bigger caps uh, here in Hong Kong pulling the down. It's BOJ Day. We haven't gotten to that, uh, uh, of course, here in the region. Quarter of 1% to the downside here, so no change expected from the BOJ, but we're watching out for any any small changes to to just uh, texture and, and the terminology uh, yeah, and, and, you know, and really how they frame any potential changes that may be down the road. So we're keeping an eye on and really sniffing out any potential changes that may come from that. Bond markets are on offer right now. Your 10-year yield in China is up one basis point. So we're still trading at about these three-month lows here, Bill. Yeah, and a key group of, of companies we're watching this morning are the Apple suppliers, of yeah. course. And there's two big stories, actually, that we're, we're watching off this. So first, we've got Apple. It's going to stop selling, or it's being forced to stop selling the latest version of its smartwatch in the U.S. So it's uh, lost, essentially, a patent dispute. So it's taking some of its best-selling devices off the market during, of course, the busy holiday season. So we're seeing some of those declines there. But at the same time, uh, a couple of hours later, we just had another great story coming out from our, our tech reporter, Mark Gurman, uh, telling us that Apple, as well as just days away uh, from, from pushing through a rescue mission for the multi-billion dollar business as well. So Mark is joining us now from Los Angeles. Thanks very much for your time here, Mark. Uh, just talk us through exactly what we sort of need to know at this stage. There's the patent issue, but then there's also this, this turnaround mission as well. Yeah, so the two go together, right? The, the patent issue has to do with the patents for blood oxygen saturation. That's the feature on the watch that's existed since 2020 that tells you how much oxygen is in your blood. Uh, in most cases, that's going to be between 95 and 100 percent. So if you're familiar with that reading in the medical world, that's what I'm referring to. Now, the Apple Watch sales in the U.S. on the online store, those are going to seize on the 21st. Retail stores, they have about 270 physical retail stores. Those sales will seize uh, on Christmas Eve, so next Sunday, Monday time frame. Uh, and this is a big development. There has never been a case in the modern history of Apple where they've had to pull sales of a major new product release. Uh, at the same time, this is happening at the most unopportune time, right at the heart of when people are buying gifts potentially for Christmas and New Year's and such. So this is absolutely a, you know, a dramatic negative event for Apple, a big win for Mossimo. Uh, the expectation was that Apple was going to find some way to avoid this import ban, but clearly they're not anticipating that. There is a few day window still, like I said, Christmas Day is when this goes into effect. So the Biden administration and the White House in the U.S. could theoretically still step in and veto it. But I don't believe anyone, including myself, is under the impression that's going to happen at this point. And then in terms of my other story, Apple is racing to create a software fix. They believe this is an issue that can be mitigated with a software update. Mossimo, of course, believes this is an issue that has to be mitigated by a hardware change. Software update, that could take a matter of weeks. Hardware change, that could take a matter of months. So it's pretty obvious why each side believes uh, what they believe at this point. Mark, so worst, worst, worst case scenario for Apple, and to your point, the most inopportune time to, to really see something like this, what's the revenue hit likely going to be? I mean, worst case for Apple, the revenue hit, uh, probably a couple billion dollars. The Apple Watch is a $17 billion a year business. The models that are impacted probably make up 80%, 85% of sales. And then at the same time, uh, you have a situation where these sales will continue at Best Buy, at Target, uh, at Costco, some of the big third party, big box retailers in the US. And this is not applicable internationally. So you're talking about Two of the three models they sell only in one country and only impacting their first party retail channels. So it is a really big deal, but I wouldn't believe this is going to create more than a one to two billion dollar headwind at this point. All right, Mark, thanks very much for time. That was great reporting there from Bloomberg's tech correspondent, Mark Gurman, joining us. Uh, we'll have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Right, welcome back. A couple of movers that we're tracking here, as you can see here. So Neo, big move overnight in the U.S., uh, follow-up move here in the Asia-Pacific and Hong Kong with the Hong Kong listing here of crash injection, of course, uh, out of Abu Dhabi there, 2.2B. Uh, we're also looking at some of these, and this is not just a China story, uh, say, to say the least here, certainly the logistics and shipping companies mm. on the back of what's taking place, of course, the disruptions taking place in the Red Sea here. Yeah, it's a really big story we're, we're getting here. We've essentially seen Iran back Houthis stepping up their, their attacks on vessels that are yeah. passing through the Suez Canal. It's a, a main route for global LNG trade. Yeah. It's something that has had really significant ramifications, and we have seen that market reaction because you're even seeing it there in Shanghai Crude, for instance, up 2% at this point. Uh, and uh, certainly we're also seeing those flow-on effects into, for instance, China container rates. They're also jumping here with these tensions right. that are rising. So it is more of a global story that's really developing out of this. But broadly, the session so far, we're, we're getting a lot of weakness really across the screen. As we said, energy is really that so, one of the few sectors there that is posting some sort of gains here. But weakness across the board, and it sort of just follows that market, still trying to understand exactly how firm the Fed is pushing back on these rate cut expectations, what that means. And then you've also got, of course, the big one today in Asia, which is... The BOJ. Yes. <laughs> um, and, I mean, they're not going to do anything. Well, that's the, that's the consensus. And certainly the potential for them to do something is, is, is certainly being priced into this market. You know, your, people are actually trading on that possibility with, you know, you're, you're actually buying and selling the hedging costs on, on the yen right now. So the cost to hedge the yen, for example, today, overnight fall from last night into this morning, continuing to move up. You're now paying the highest cost to hedge your yen exposure in about five months or so. Uh, that's not it, but okay, we can talk more about that in just a moment there. And yeah, we're looking at that. And yeah, the BOJ could come up with a big nothing burger. So we'll stand by for that in the next hour of Bloomberg Markets. Stay with us. You're watching Bloomberg.